This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. Any chance I have to go down memory lane with a complete stranger is a thrill. Now, you're not a complete stranger because I know you from social media. I know you as an AUB academic. I've even heard you speak several times. I snuck myself in to Jemeze once. You were, you were talking. And I just sort of sat in the back. This may have been Alia years ago. But it's just a moment, a chance encounter, where you were talking to people and I was listening. Uh, one of the co-hosts of this podcast is a deep admirer of yours, Elia Haber. And she's, I think, in Montreal now, pursuing science journalism. Uh, there have been hundreds of people suggesting I speak with you. And this is now maybe three years in the making. Hussam Al Eid <laughs> takes full advantage of me going to Urbanista, stops me and says, Why haven't you spoken to Najat? <laughs> I said, You know, you're right. I'll do it my way. And he said, No, 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 no. Do it his way. Hands me your number. And now we're talking. I'm an admirer of storytellers. And I think, whether intentionally or not, you're a gifted storyteller. Because anytime I hear you speak about this tragedy we're going through, you begin with Demur, which I really enjoy. And I enjoy it for selfish reasons. Because my childhood, any escape from Beirut heading south, before the highway was finished to Sur, it's the beauty of Demur. And I don't think of it otherwise. It's always beautiful. Even when you have that civil war tragedy associated, but the nature is, it's really special and it stands out. And I got to know that you're really of the earth. You don't just respect the earth. You're from the earth, if you will. You have so much passion for banana fields <laughs> <laughs> and vegetation. And every video I've seen of you recently, I think, is either on the beach in Demur or you're beginning the story there. And I think the year is important because you always say 1974. Right. And it's right before this whole experiment began to plunder. You're alive back then, I'm not. I've only heard stories. But I like going back in time enough. And this is my very long way of introducing your story because I think in many ways, whether you're saying it or not all the time, it's, I think, a longing to return for some semblance of normality. And that it mean, in itself means good governance, but not great governance, normal governance that you can reform and you can build from. You're not aiming for the stars, but you want some semblance of normality. Normality, That resonates with me. So let's start, if you will, with why someone with your skill set, primarily in the sciences, but you're an expert on many things when it comes to environmental issues. You're an expert on waste management, pollution levels that we deal with. I think you, your name and AUB go hand in hand. Why is someone with a skill set like yours taking the very <laughs> painful road of local politics and parliamentary elections. I know it's a very long and very perhaps wide question to start with, but I think it's important because you're an inspiration to many people. And I'd like to explore your psychology first before we get into hard politics. Whoa, that's a long introduction. I'll edit it later. <laughs> and that's a lot to deal with and to think about. <laughs> My God, you brought in so many things, so many, so many memories in this introduction. In fact, those memories are the path mm. that actually uh, uh, make, make you. Yeah. 
So if it wasn't for the 1974 massacre in the Moor, and if it wasn't for me uh, being brought up in a farmland and being the daughter of a farmer and being called or would like to be called the daughter of the earth, if it wasn't for all of this, I don't think I would have been an environmental mm. activist. Mm. And I don't think I would have been the scholar activist that I would like to call myself now, taking those words into implementation mm. and venturing into a new field, challenging myself first, mm. and then challenging the politicians to deal with the scientists. Is there anything going back to the mid-1970s, before the Civil War, that you hold on to when it comes to your expectations of what Lebanon should function like? And I'm asking it this way because my understanding is that Lebanon ne never had fully functional governance. It was wobbly at best. But that there was a semblance of, of decent governance. And I would, maybe it's a natural question, maybe not. But are you holding on to something that you lost in 1974, early 1975? No, not whatsoever. Mm. I think pre-immigration uh, or migration from the Moor was a very, very, very normal, uh, conventional, conservative life. Mm. Nothing uh, extraordinary. I was... Uh, one out of six kids. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. Wow. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I was the oldest among the girls, but I have a brother who's older than me. Hmm. So I was given some responsibility to look after my little sisters, hmm. but nothing much that is, you know, that, that, that is there to hold on to. I see. I think it's the war, the civil war, and the forced migration from our home once, twice, three times, and perhaps four times, if we want to count the number of homes that we made, that made me angry and look for hope every time the word crumbles around us. There's something about your story that links up to many of your generation, and this includes my own family and my parents, that had to leave this country to pursue their dreams. And I like, these are maybe anecdotal examples, but I've heard you say this, that with your, with your father, it was a choice between chemistry or biology. And you were adamant to choose one and you ended up with the other, but it's still the science world. Uh, but that scholarly work or that research was primarily in California, if I understood correctly. And in early 2000s, you make this return to mm -hmm. Lebanon. And it's some, it's decades after you last saw Demur. If I, I hope I got that right. So there's, I think there's this yearning to give this country another chance. And I'm wondering, this is maybe, this is too long of a duration maybe, but in the last two decades, I can imagine there's immense disappointment with how this country emerged from the civil war. And has that in any way shaped your politics today? Meaning, have you seen things happen in this country in the last two decades where it's repetition that you're trying to stop? Or is it something completely different that you're starting in a way from scratch with your own aspirations? And this could even feed into earlier attempts at reform. And they could be cosmetic or they could be even benign at times. But this is definitely not the first time Lebanese have tried. So is, is there anything in the lessons learned maybe in the last two decades that you want to prevent? I have a great belief, belief in, in the country and in the people of this country. I think there, are, there is so much goodness in the hearts of these people, mm -hmm. of my people, of, my, of this country, of the people who live in this country. And I'm not, I'm not naive. I think every person I meet, I feel I gain the word afterwards. It's so much richness 
in the heart and in the mind of the Lebanese people and the residents of this country as well. I don't know why when they go to rule, they change. Is it because we never built a system? Is it because we cannot be confined in this in a system? Or is it because we let the ugly rule over the good? I don't know. But when you take people individually, mm. at least when I take all the people I have met so far mm. in my life, I have really gained so much. And I have really benefited from the goodness and the positivity of each and every single person I have met. That's why I believe in this country. I really believe, and, and I would not give up. I know that there are some corrupt people. Mm. And I know that some people are, are actually more than corrupt. They're criminals. But they're not the majority. Mm. They are the minority. They have ruled the country because people are good. And they have taken full advantage of people. Mm. I hope I'm not very naive that they will take advantage of me and also exploit, you know, drag me into, into their, uh, uh, their ugliness. But, but it is this collective goodness that drives me and continues to push me to break glass ceilings and continue to hope that this country one day is going to be the country that we love. I'm going to try to merge two things together, which resonates with me, the way you're describing this little real estate called Lebanon, and the difficulties of moving forward in a sensible way. I agree that this is probably the most tolerant, cosmopolitan, diverse and enriched diversity, little edge of planet Earth, and I think there's no place more beautiful than Lebanon. And I also would add to that, this seems to be the hardest country to govern. <laughs> so it's a very odd sort of gathering of two things yes. at once. And your perspective is, is obviously mm -hmm. wider than mine. I mean, you you know Lebanon in a way that I'll never know. And you're, I think, anyone that's approaching politics with an expertise in the background faces a big challenge, which is Lebanese politics is difficult even when the country's doing better. I think it, you're battling inertia. You're battering ingrained, entrenched communalism, sectarianism, things that make it maybe inefficient on a good day. But that said, if you could put or if you could hone in on a structural problem that you see in front of you that you would like to change fundamentally, it doesn't even have to be in your current candidacy, which we'll, we'll get into. But as you as a citizen, is there a primary obstacle in, in your way when it comes to reform. And if there is one, could you describe it the way you see it? Yes. The thing that bothers me the most is that whenever we want to solve a problem, we don't approach it systematically, scientifically, mm. with a strategic plan. Mm. And without data and without evidence and without a feasibility study, or SWOT analysis, or anything that would make a long-term strategic plan, all solutions that are proposed will be fit to one or more of the personal gains. So I, don't, I, I would hope that by bringing in one or more scientific people into the parliament, that the way we think about our problems is mm. changed. And that's what I would like to see. I don't want to talk about one particular, you know, problem because we have many. Mm. I want to talk about the process of getting to solve the problem. And this mm. is what is missing. We always tend to, we always feel in Lebanon like we're watching a movie yeah. and that, the, the, you know, the, the, the hero has to gain, has to be, you know, we need to clap at the end of the movie right. and, and everybody <laughs> has to leave happy. Yeah. This is not the way we solve problems. Well, I appreciate this analysis process. 
the process. I'm mm. a person of a process. And you're emphasizing science background, which I enjoy as well. You don't see much of that, although you do see certain careers. You see a lot of engineers. You see a lot of, at times, lawyers. But I appreciate that you're talking, I think, more about STEM in yes. that sense. You want yes. that in Parliament too. Yes, yes. Well, let me then try to offer a comparison. Two people I deeply admire, although we just met. But I, I'm not trying to massage anyone's ego, but I do really appreciate what you're doing. I also appreciate Ziad Abishakir. He was on the podcast uh, several days ago, actually. And I know it's not the same career, but I think there's a lot of parallel. And there is overlap at times, in at least waste management, or the ideas of how to improve the environment in general. I asked him a similar question. Someone with the right intentions, trying to get something done through parliament. Do you see parliament as the way to get something like this done? Or do you see it more as in you're entering parliament to pressure parties that are more visible and more established to begin doing the right thing? Because I'm wondering what individuals in parliament can actually do on something very basic, but something that is also killing us, which is our environment. So um, maybe it's, it's a stretch a bit, but do you see your role as pressure or do you see it as actually process and, and politics? I think I usually, all throughout my career, if I want to put pressure, I show the way. Mm. I walk the talk. Mm. I'm a person of a process that leads to solutions. I cannot live without doing, you know, getting to the end of the process and seeing a solution implemented. Mm. I can't do it. I mean, this is, it gets me angry, it gets me anxious. If I can't do it, if I can't find a solution, that means I didn't, I didn't get it done. Mm. And, so, and so the role of the MP is not only to come up with new laws. It's about taking those, those laws from the book to, the, to action. And the way we do this is by creating the process by which the law is implemented and then enforced. We have mm. so many laws that have been advanced yeah. or, or proposed, but we lack the process of how those laws are going to be implemented and why and how to improve the laws. Mm. So it's not only finding the process of implementing them, it's also revisiting the laws to see whether they have made the impact that was intended to make. And I mm. say this because in air pollution in particular, for example, yeah. we come up with a law or a recommendation to bring the levels, the rec the, the levels of air pollution down. Mm -hmm. Okay, we say there is a strategic plan, for example, for the air pollution to drop by 20%, for example, by 2025. I'm yeah. just making numbers yeah, sure, here. Sure. Yeah. And so what do, you, what do we do? We map the emission sources from the grounds. We also measure air pollution continuously. And we do simulation scenarios. What if this source is reduced? What if this other source is reduced? And it's an iterative process. Because otherwise, we don't know whether the law has been, has been, you know, has been fulfilled and we don't know whether we are able, following the same process, to improve even more. So it's an iterative process that has to be revisited. So, mm -hmm. so that's the beauty of the process. It, is, it checks and balances. What I appreciate is that you're doing something which works for me right away. It comes naturally. You're taking me back to my AUB days. And all the wonderful ideas that I heard in my career, my long career at AUB, all the passion and enthusiasm that came from almost every single department. And then the immense frustration that all that research is never implemented. So here's a huge question. All the technical skills, all the research has been done. Uh, I think if we both walk down any street today and it could be here on Bliss or even anywhere, we'll run into experts. And they're usually friends of ours, and I think we all know each other. So we've solved the problems. We've done our work. 
and then getting that problem solving, which is what you want, into parliament, to me still seems like a distant dream. So what could you do which is different than what has been tried before? Is it a block that is insisting on process? Is it a coalition of experts within parliament that are making this their their agenda? Or is there a structural hurdle that is not so visible, maybe, that would make anyone's dreams fade the moment they enter power? Because I, I still don't see it. And I'm saying this as somebody who dreams of it, too. But I still can't see it. But I have done it. Mm. It's not mm. like something that I have not done. Mm. Mm. I've done it. I've done it with villages. I, in, yeah. you know, I, I direct the Environment Academy. And I ask local communities mm. to identify their pressing environmental problems. Mm. And I work with them on a systematic approach, mm. of course, with the help of experts. And then together, after we gather the evidence, together we co-create the best fit solution for the local communities because context mm. matters a lot. So is this a... I asked Ziad... We actually reached the same point. He sees his role in parliament as married to the municipal level. I mean, in a way, I think he assumes that it's his responsibility too. Is that similar in that you see an avenue through parliament, but also addressing those local concerns and bringing them together? Or are they separate spheres? No, they can't be separate mm. beca because we also work with local municipalities, mm. with the local government. Right. And sometimes we, we, we work with the regional government. Mm -hmm. yes. And sometimes we even have to go to the ministry to work with the ministry. And I give an example. Mm. We are working with a village that does not have water. They only rely on the water catchments in the winter. And so in the summer, all these ponds or, or, or uh, you know, uh, water catchments, they dry out in the yeah. summer. So literally, these people have to truck water into their homes in order for them to get water, mm. right? So in this case, we worked with the local communities. We also have to work with the local authority, that is the municipality. Yeah. And here also we have the North Water Establishment mm. that has to be part of our solution. And also we have to go to the ministry, to, to, to the Ministry of Energy, because we will need their support in order for us to implement a, a, a solution. So yeah. solutions, even if they seem to be remote and for villages, they're not detached from the whole structure from the whole governmental structure. And so slowly but surely, we start implementing and creating uh, pockets of goodwill mm. and pockets of solutions. So in a sense, it's a layered, layered form of responsibility and procedure. And you're able to see it in a way that goes all the way from the ministry down to the municipality. And the pursuit in parliament, as opposed to a more traditional role in civil society. I think almost everyone I know, and I mean this in terms of almost scientific research, everyone I know is running for parliament. <laughs> <laughs> I can show you the stats. Excel oh sheet. Everyone. And maybe 90% are from civil society. Over one majority. And they come from all sectors. I know that you helped establish Khadit Beirut, which was just after the port blast. And many people I know were in that world. On occasion, I even was sitting in a cafe and I'd see Zoom calls happening and you were there. Those were Zoom calls on Khadat Beirut. Everyone I know is trying to do the right thing in civil society and there's deep frustration. Is this a reckoning that civil society's role in Lebanon can only go so far? But to actually move things forward, you have to go another step further. And is that something you came to in a way? Is there a conclusion on your part? And does it have anything to do with the port blast that you saw your role shift a bit? Khadid Beirut is a beautiful initiative that came the second day after the blast. Mm. When Carmen came and visited and she said, let's take a walk in the city. And literally, we were walking on crushed glass yeah. everywhere. 
we could not find a spot, a place, a small place where we can put our feet without really stepping on glass. It was heartbreaking. Windows of buildings and buildings. We walked for hours yeah. and we couldn't see a window holding there. Furnitures were hanging from balconies. It was devastating. It was devastating. And Carmen looked at me and she said, we must do something. Hmm. We really have to do something. We can't sit and watch and we can't let the international organizations come and only give us humanitarian aid right. because that's going to ruin everything we have left. Mm -hmm. And she was absolutely right. And this is when it all started. So we went back to my apartment and we start calling scholars, oh, friends. It's nice to know exactly how it happened. Right. I did not know that it's that intimate. It's yes. really two friends, two colleagues making magic happen at once. It was magic. Wow. Nice. So we called on our friends. And just two hours later, we had almost 100 people, yeah. 100 friends from all over the world mm. saying, yes, we want to put our expertise into action and we want to help our city come back to life. Yeah. And this is where the word scholar activism came from. I see. But what is very important is that from day one, from, you know, our one, we realized that we're never, we are never going to be replacing the government. And mm. we are mm. not an NGO. And what we want to do is only put our expertise into action to create models that resemble us, mm. small pockets that resemble us right. so that we can offer them to the government later to replicate those models and save the city. So it was not about humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. It was not about creating our own entity. No, yeah. never. Yeah. It was not about replacing the government because we didn't trust the government. We knew that in the government there are places where you can trust mm -hmm. and there are heroes who are still in their, in their, in their jobs try, trying to fight the system. So, so, and I was so fortunate to work with so many, despite the, 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 uh, you know, the grim and the, the dark situation. I think our work together gave us strength. It gave us hope. And it gave us also uh, a, lot, a lot of richness. And I always say that. And this is the common good I talk about yes. all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, in two hours, you had 100 people roll, rallying all their energy, all that, that they can do together to create those models of excellence that we call in order for us to alleviate the pain of us first and other family members and friends second. It was beautiful. It was beautiful and really it was magic. And guess what? We got to know six principles because in the education initiative, we divided ourselves into mm -hmm. four initiatives. Yes. Yeah, education, yeah. health, um, environment and supporting small and medium businesses. Mm -hmm. In the education initiative, we got to know six principles, women who really who were fighting to get the schools back on their feet, who, ha who know, or, and I'm talking about public schools. Yes. They yeah. know every single student. They know the state of the student. Mm. The teachers are fighting and they came back to also save the year for the students without even getting a decent pay that will allow them to cover only the, tra the transportations from, from their home to the schools. I mean, I met so many heroes, so many people so dedicated to their job, to their city and to Lebanon. It's, 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 heart, it's heartwarming. I think, the, I mean, that moment, the aftermath is tremendously tragic and also tremendously terrific. It's the same. Seeing volunteers just show up without any initiative and people not sleeping for weeks on end. And I, I think it's fair to say civil society rebuilt Jemezi, Maram Khail, and a lot of the damage that was within the vicinity of the port, not the state. A lot of people, a lot of NGOs, and I know you're not Khadid Beirut, not maybe an NGO, but the crowd that it attracts was heading all over the place, and a lot of good work was done. But 
I'm going to maybe ask you a more sensitive question here because we will get into your district. We will get into your direct pursuit. But I have to ask this because it's maybe it's the bigger question at play. The what allows for a city like Beirut to host over 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate to begin with, I think is beyond the civil society scope, and I think it's beyond parliament, and I think, unfortunately, it's beyond the state. And I say this in a bold way, because I know technically this is in the state, and there are state actors that should be more far more diligent about something like this. But I see this as something that also destroyed Lebanon in 1975. And I see a common thread. And I don't want to push you in any direction you're uncomfortable. I think we could spend hours talking about that discomfort, and it's a different topic maybe. But there's part of it, I think, that feeds in. Lebanon pays a price that has nothing to do with the tolerance or the dignity or the genuine uh, love that Lebanese share. And I still don't know what anyone could do to fix that disorder, whether they're from civil society or not. I think it, it's, uh, it's across the spectrum. So I'll try to narrow this down to something more digestible. Is there an obvious limit to what can be done given the current circumstance? And is there maybe a a short, medium-term acceptance that the, the, the maneuvering space is limited by design, that you can get certain things done a little better, but there is a strategic problem that is beyond us all. I see, I see the two points. I mean, first, we need to become more responsible, and people who don't do their job have to be held accountable for that. Mm. And that's our problem. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not any country's problem, any international community's problem. Mm. Our finding or our build for the structure of the country and become more responsible in governmental jobs is extremely important. Mm. As a chemist, I cannot conceive anyone responsible allowing ammonium nitrate to be stored with fireworks and with tires and with some coffee and tea together in one container. This is the ABC of safety that we teach to our freshman students, yeah. that you cannot put something flammable next to a Bunsen burner. Right? So this is the minimum that has nothing to do with the regional or mm. international politics. Mm, mm. This is our problem. Mm. And our problem is to put the right people in the right place and to hold responsible people accountable for their action. Mm. And that's extremely important. I cannot conceive also that Minister of Health, for example, does not do round trips to make sure that what we eat is safe. Yeah. Those are basic human rights yeah. that we chose to ignore or we chose to turn the eye on. It's not acceptable. And I don't believe any international community that wants to sell you know, weapons, or they are very corrupt. Mm. Regardless, this is our responsibility. This is our safety. Mm. This is the safety of their children. It's impossible for me to even think about one responsible person allowing this to happen. I'll tell you a personal story. I, you would have never known this. Uh, I happened to not be in Beirut when the, when the port blast happened. I was in New York. Um, I, before I spent days on end trying to donate money through the podcast to a, a wide range of NGOs. And it's funny when you're in New York, when this is happening here and you look out the window, 
there's protests happening in, in New York for other issues altogether, and I didn't even see them. My mind was plugged into this tragedy. One of the first things I remember is you telling everyone to close their windows. And I called my mom, and I said, close your window. And it's almost like you're, you're the minister of responsibility. <laughs> you're the minister of environment, or you're the minister. You're just doing your job, and I'm listening to you, and I would never think to even listen to anyone serving the state then. I'm turning to you. This is just a small, silly example, maybe, but it shows where the disconnect is. Now let's fast forward from there, and I'll take liberty in trying to bring Nasir Yassin to the table. <laughs> He's not here. He's been on the podcast a few times before he became minister. I don't know if he'll come on again. <laughs> <laughs> but whether you like him or not, whether you think he's, uh, he's made a mistake in his career or not, I think it's all besides the point. To me, he still represents someone who wants accountability. I still associate him more with the October 17 crowd than I do with either Saad Hariri or Najib Miati. I think of him as an independent man. And I think that is true. And he is the Minister of Environment. Let's assume his intentions are genuine. I don't think much has been done since he became minister. And that's someone with party backing. That's not somebody who's, he's not opposing. He's actually one of. He's not able to get much done. Is there any advantage someone not in his shoes has in getting that kind of work done? And I know his is ministerial level, but I'll take it down all the way doesn't have to be the ministry level. It could be at any level. Is there a built-in advantage and an, a more independent person would have trying to do the same work? Absolutely. Hmm. You have to be completely independent of this corrupt crowd. Hmm. You can't. Hmm. You can't be part of them and do anything. Because everything they do is not a strategic planning. They don't care about the process. They only care about how much there is in it for them. Mm. And I'm not speaking about it just to accuse them. I audited the implementation of the reclaimed land to turn it into a dump in Burj Hamoud and Jdaydi. And I saw how they implement the projects. I saw it firsthand. I reviewed documents, hundreds and hundreds of pages, and turned a report of 50 pages, okay, to, 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 to the government. They did nothing. Yeah. I worked with one of the ministers of environment, and I told them about the best way to do a solid waste management plan. It's not probably the best solid waste management plan, but we could have discussed it. Yeah. They didn't even want to discuss it. They just wanted the shortest way to their pocket. So I'm not accusing them based on just feelings. I have evidence. I'll be extra careful because I'll leave this terrain in a bit. But let's just assume that the intentions are both on both sides, meaning somebody like him or someone else from a completely independent party or comp- forget party, an independent person. Is there a wall that is blocking both actors from getting there? Because I'm, I'm trying to see what someone else would have been able to do. And I'm assuming not every decision taken or not, um, not every negligence is done by design. I'm assuming there is structural problems that anyone faces in this country. And I, maybe it's not good to recommend this without having the facts in front of me, but I could think that I could think of somebody even more noble than Nasir Yassin, and I think that dump which is entering Jdeide, or it's in Jdeide already, would continue to grow. And I don't know if I'm being Look, too pessimistic. No, 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 you're right. Dr. Yassin is a friend and a colleague, and we don't know how much he was able to do, mm. because... He's been, in, he's been a minister for only a short period That's of true. time. Yeah. It's too early to judge. Mm. 
And I know he's not saving time without wasting time. Yes. He's, he's, yeah. he's trying. Mm-hmm. And in fact, one of the Environment Academy projects that we're doing is in Akkar Latia, And we wanted mm-hmm. to protect the fir forest tree. Yeah. And he was very, very supportive. Mm-hmm. He spent two hours with the local community and the head of the municipality mm-hmm. there exploring the best ways of how to protect this forest. Mm. So it was, this is something that I witnessed. It was in front of my eyes. Right. I was on the table with the local community, and he was even willing to go on a hike on this forest to yeah. actually highlight the importance of the forest. So it's mm. probably too, much, too premature to mm. judge of how much he was able to do. Yes. But in general, what I meant in general, an independent person would be able to make a lot more mm. than a person who has to comply with a party or with a group of people. I think that's a fair judgment to make, and I think it's never properly been tested anyway, so it's worth even trying it. But I wish I was less skeptical of the best intentions facing the same wall. Maybe that's a wall I always hit when I reach that conclusion. But I appreciate the attempt to continue to try even when it's not coming from a party necessarily or even from a political machine it's coming from the most well-intentioned citizens you're an expert on air pollutant levels i don't know if that's a good or bad thing but i sometimes lean on what you're writing or what you're saying whether or not i should open a window or keep it closed and it's been what three or four days now or maybe longer no power no no government power generator power and it's toxic to breathe Beirut's air let alone most of Lebanon right now it's it's just haze of smog and we both know that the generator industry in Lebanon is not something that is easily undone and I can't imagine I can't imagine that being tackled properly in parliament even if you have an alternative even if you have the right minister of energy even if you have the majority of Lebanese demanding it. And we saw what happened a few nights ago. I think it was in Pacifico, maybe, in Mono. The Minister of Energy was almost thrown to the wall. He was not singing in that episode, which is good. (laughs) That would have been a little too much. But how would an MP be able to circumvent what is now decades old? this generator industry in Lebanon. And at the end of the day, what really can be done now that we know the World Bank is not going to be providing energy? As far as I understand, that whole deal has sort of become undone. There's no nothing coming from Egypt anytime soon. So in someone in your shoes in parliament, knowing that toxic, it's, it's unbearable now, and you have a crisis that is beyond us. What, what, what can be done? There is a lot that can be done. In 2010, we did our first study on diesel generators. Mm. And the electricity was cut only three hours a day. Yes, right. And this is when we found out that anybody living in the city especially in Hamra, this is where we did our study, Mm. would be inhaling toxins equivalent to either one or two cigarettes per day. Wow. That was in 2010. That's only three hours. That's only three hours. And then since then, I was giving recommendations in my publications and never, never in my life, I imagined that we're going to get that far. (laughs) I thought it was disastrous then. Yeah. And then when I moved back to Ashrafiyi and I look around and I see generators everywhere. Yeah. The density of generator in the city, of generators in the city is 50%. That means you have mm. one diesel generator in between every two buildings. Right. And those are Irrespective of those regional generators that plug in neighborhoods. No, I mean, we counted, we took an area Mm, and we counted 
the number of generators oh, yes, and yeah. we counted the number of buildings. Wow. Yeah. And it turned out in 2010, it was 50%. And in, oh, that's 20, in 2010, it's 50%. Right. And oh, in 2018, oh. it was also to 50%. Uh-huh. Okay. So the number of diesel generators might not have increased. I see. But yes. maybe, maybe the amount of power that we are generating mm-hmm. from these diesel generators have, yeah. have increased, probably. And that's before the plunge into Exactly. Darkness. So I yeah. don't have the statistics hmm. post-2018, which yeah. is before the plunge. Yeah, and during the plunge, I don't know whether the number of generators has increased or not. Well, let me throw an anecdotal example. I live in Marim Khair. I'm seeing memories of civil war. Generators on balconies. Something I haven't seen since the 80s, maybe in the early 90s at most. There's a shop downstairs that is doing the that generator sound every morning. It's the rumbling that I remember of war. And everyone is increasingly doing it. I think it's technically still illegal. Um, is there a way to mitigate the downside of having one of every two buildings, for example, uh, polluting so much short of an electricity solution? Because assuming the government electricity doesn't really improve reasonably, what could be done to at least try to survive this stretch? And I'm sorry for if it's maybe a naive question, but is it just a matter of filtering or trying to have more responsible generator oversight? I mean, how, of how does it look? Of course it's a matter of filtering, but mm. where is the catch-22 or the irony of the law? The government for the longest time said we cannot put uh, laws and regulations on the diesel generators. Why? Because it means we're admitting that we have an electricity (laughs) problem. (laughs) I didn't know that. That's pretty bad. (laughs) Wow. So for the longest time, they said, there is a law only for huge generators, for big generators. Right, right. But if we start admitting that we have an electricity problem, then we are forced to put laws and regulations on the smaller generators. Mm. So we stayed for 10 years in limbo. Yeah. Where you, you cannot, you cannot, there is no law to enforce how these generators are emitting toxins everywhere. And, and... At the same time, we cannot live without them because we don't have electricity. Right. So in a way, it's, it's, it's not just admitting, but it's forcing some process on the... This is not sub-state. It's more just state replacement, that you're, you're trying to find a solution to what shouldn't even be there to begin exactly. with. Exactly. Yeah. And if we start admitting that these generators are important in the country and yeah. they are the providers of electricity, yes. that means the owners of the generators have the right to make a union and they become legal. I see. And they, you know, this sector becomes a legal sector in the country where this sector actually emanated from a great need yeah. to subsidize the power, the electricity cut. Do you see the So road? so you see the complexity yeah. of, of this problem? Yeah. But is that how you see things moving forward knowing that we're going to remain without serious government. Exactly. So what mm. we need to do is legalize those right. people yes. and the, this sector yeah. and start putting some laws to really enforce some emission control on the diesel generators. I mean, it's, it's reached almost the end of the road now where we have no government electricity, but we have to regulate still. So we're regulating the private sector, which has replaced the government. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so that's why they don't want to regulate. They don't want to admit yeah. that we have a private sector that is providing electricity to people, and yet, and yet, the government is unable to provide any electricity. This is hilarious. And then they go, they go inside the the ministry or the you know the cabinet, and they discuss whether they should privatize electricity. But it's already privatized. That's pri- right. That's well said. Actually, <laughs> that's well said. There's. A something that I have no, um, I can't see something else happening in the meantime, which is waste burning. I've seen it increasing. It, it used to just be a few trash bins. Now it seems to even happen at times in British Hamoud and Jdeidi, at least at night. It looks like there's fires erupting from trash. And I think that's really happening all the time. We just breathe it now and we got used to it. 
but there's a way of dealing with it that is so toxic. And I wanted to ask you if that is, if that is carelessness or is that actual policy to burn it and why it seems to have increased dramatically. And it's this, okay. yeah, I, I'm sorry. This is, this is very, very important because in, during our negotiation uh, with the local government in, uh, government mm. in, in, in Beirut, and during our protests against incinerators, yes, yeah, people were defending incinerators by saying, or not people, the local government in Beirut was mm. defending incinerators by saying that the regu- that people in Beirut do not know how to sort their waste, so that we can take some of it to recycling and some of it to dump. This is post you stink. Uh, this is in right. the yeah right. when the trash right. was unbearable already. Uh, this this was in 2017. Uh, 2017, 20, right, right? Of course, yes. So yeah. so post uh, you stink movement, there was a huge crisis of uh, garbage crisis. Yes. But then later there were so many discussions about how to solve our solid waste ma- the waste problem, and one of the solution was to bring in incinerators, yeah, right. and we were completely opposing incinerators because not because because of the technology itself just because we do not we do not trust the government in really controlling the emissions of these incinerators and we know that emissions if they don't burn the incinerators well they could get really nasty even per- perhaps worse than what we're seeing now exactly so yeah. so plus plus there was there was a huge investment in incinerators and the mm, return mm. on investment was too much for people to bear because also the type of waste that we have needed extra fuel to add to the to the yeah, incinerator yes. so that they burn at the right temperature so it's all about this technological technological challenges that we tried to explain and they didn't want to listen. But that's not the point. Mm-hmm. The point is now, people, scavengers, waste scavengers, mm-hmm. know that if they pick the plastic and the cardboards and the metals from the waste, they actually can make good money. Right. Because the ton of plastic that is, for, you know, that is sold for recycling is $300. Oh, wow. So now... Recycling has become a resource that we have to do. So the scavengers, I believe, who are now picking all these recyclables from the waste yes. bins yeah. and from the landfill in Bush Hamoud and mm. Jdaidi, are smarter than our local government <laughs> because they have realized the importance of these resources. And guess what? Nobody taught them how to recycle. They know how to do it. Nobody taught them how to sort the waste. They know how to do it. What happens after they pick up all of this recyclables, they burn the waste. Because once oh. the new waste comes, they don't want to start, you know, working with the old oh, waste. Oh, I see. So, so they burn it in, uh, on purpose. And guess what? They are so many groups of scavengers now and every night they fight over the recyclables and the local government and and I think the the police does not they're going inside this is fascinating I would have never known that this is all happening and it's all happening for I mean it's you have waste sorting and then you have burning to make sure it's easier to get plastic next round right for, and it's $300 per ton. Yes. You know, not counting the metals. Right, yeah. And not counting the, the, card, the, the, the paper, basically. Wow. So, so the scavengers are smart. They know how to sort. Yeah. So everyone could have learned how to sort if right. they wanted to. That's well said. I, I always thought of incentive as the need, or even for that matter, on the other end, a fine for not sorting things correctly or reusing appropriately or recycling when it's an option. But this is a uh, lawless scenario where the scavenger is doing the job. This is crazy. It is crazy. It is crazy. And it's so sad because wow. now the scavengers are also picking the recyclables even before they go to the landfill. And they're just dispersing all the right. waste on the road. Right, right. 
Yeah. I mean, I am not against the scavengers. In, the, in fact, they are doing a good job because they are using <laughs> the resources right. wisely. But it's the, the after effect. Of, it's, it's, yeah. the, it's how they're doing yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate this very unique perspective on what's going on. I would have never known this. I'm sorry I've taken a lot of your time, Najat. I'll, I'll try to wrap it up with maybe it's the most important, but it's also uh, it builds us here. You're running in the Shuf district. You're from your district, and you're campaigning where you're meant to campaign. Uh, I'm curious in your in your politics, in your pursuit right now. When you talk to AUB students, which you do fantastically and when you talk to anyone who's curious like me and you're very persuasive when you when you're on the ground and it's more grassroots is this the conversation that is most pressing to what people are they engaging this topic or are they more focused on things that are unfortunately more pressing to them right now and it could be things that maybe you're not even able to address meaning the absolute paralysis and financial collapse that we've all witnessed are they seeking solutions that are beyond your scope or are you able to actually touch in on things like this which are it's very important obviously but it's not necessarily what people think of right away i think the lebanese people love to talk politics (laughs) that's the right answer That's it. <laughs> and, 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 and sometimes they talk about regional and international politics before they even address their local problems. So they're talking to you about Vienna and they're also talking to you and, about... And Ukraine Na- war. And, 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 and you know... Yeah, what you know, do you think about Ukraine and, and waste I'm like, management? It's like, what do you think about your health problems? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for the video where you start talking about Ukraine. I'm like, I, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is... I was I was surprised. I mean, when I do my visits, I always, you know, get prepared to answer about, you know, our 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 daily concerns of so many things that yeah. we have to deal with. And when I ask them, I mean, what about your concerns? What do you want me to look? What do you want me to do if I get elected? How can I help you? Yeah. And they look like no answer. Oh, there's no answer. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. Oh, okay. I wouldn't have expected this. Yeah, when you ask them like specific questions about yeah. their needs, yes. I don't see clear answers. Can you point to why you think that's happening? It's because no one has asked them before. Hmm. So you're able to be, in a way, a, maybe the first politician in the making who's approaching politics the way you dreamed long ago. You're doing it the way you think it should be done. Uh, When you gauge an average audience in your politics, is there a point where you start having this discussion? Yes. I mean, they need need to trust you. Yeah. You know, people have pride. Mm -hmm. They need to trust you to start talking about their own problems. And I think that's why they like to talk about the international politics. Right. But when you manage to get to the local... What is the most pressing concern you hear when you're able to get there? It's the approach and it's different. I mean, people mm. are used to ask for help in the immediate term, meaning I need medication for my for my right. wife, for my yeah. you know, parents, blah blah blah. Yeah. And they expect from the politician to actually either direct them to a friend of a friend of a doctor of a pharmacist and help them immediately or even pay pay them right away it's which i didn't like to say of course but (laughs) but what i am trying to say and this is my answer right away Hmm. that i will never give you any money or help before election because i don't accept on me to actually do that yeah I will be able to help you directly, financially, probably after the election. Right. But what I can do is connect you with the next closest primary health care center where you can go, get checked by a doctor, and get your medication with high dignity. You don't need me. You need to know how the system is able to help you. And this is Mm. my answer. This has been my answer for the last 
five months. And I have directed people to the closest primary health care center. They have been checked by doctors and they have been able to get their medication for, in, you know, for a very little money. You know, you're able to see two things. You're able to see how traditional parties in this country operate in first from your own experience, where their demands are the shortcut vote to immediate, very immediate concerns, and you're trying to offer the long-term solution, which will help everyone long-term. With dignity. With dignity. And I think, in a way, that represents a lot of the voices that I've been fortunate enough to speak with since I started this podcast, but also really since the election season kicked off. And I think uh, the pursuits are all noble, even if some of these people are competing against each other. Um, I think there's a common need and it's a common concern, and you're very eloquently explained it. So I appreciate anyone taking a little time away from campaigning to speak with me. It's the first time we've met. Uh, It's a thrill to actually do this with you. Thank you. uh, These are all friends. I did an episode with Mark Dao. Uh, two weeks into the October uprising at Urbanista with <laughs> Hossam sitting and listening. Uh, Lori Haitayan, who I know she's not running, but she's obviously in the group. She's been on the podcast. She's a friend. These are the kinds of voices I would want in any government, let alone Lebanon, in any government, any country. But uh, I hope that my skepticism long term is proven unfounded. And I really hope this is really, at the end of the day, an issue of local responsibility. And I hope that's at least the stepping stone in the right direction. So I'll emphasize, Najat Khattar. That's your name on Najat the list. Khattar Aoun. Uh, Najat Khattar Aoun. Sorry, not yes. Najat Aoun Saliba. Yes. Najat Khattar Aoun. On the list, known as Najat Saliba. <laughs> and she's the right own, not the other one. <laughs> not the other one. <laughs> not the other ones. <laughs> Thank you, Najat. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. Every part of Lebanon that has been untouched by war or urban sprawl, to me, is majestic. And it's Demur is one true. of them. It's very true. Very, very, very true. That's why I love, I love, love Lebanon.